Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, both here in the room and online, on behalf of Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, or MHI Group, I would like to welcome you all to our panel discussion. My name is Kentaro Hosomi, and I'm the Chief Regional Officer of Mitsubishi Heavy Industries in the EMEA region. The past week has seen a lot of debate around how the world can mitigate climate change and reach net zero. We have seen progress on finance and forestry, as well as some positive energy initiatives. Governments across the globe increasingly recognize that technologies for capturing carbon dioxide have a vital role to play in supporting global efforts to reach net zero by 2050. However, in the current global annual seal to capture capacity sits at 0.04 gigatons. If the International Energy Agency is not is to be believed, this is nowhere near the projected capacity of 7.6 gigatons required to reach carbon neutrality by 2050, which would mean an almost 200-fold increase within three decades. As a company, that can proudly say we are responsible for the market leading share of the carbon capture to date. We have long seen the potential of the technology and its impact on reducing emissions. But while we see the potential, we have asked ourselves, what will it take for carbon capture technology to really grow into the role it needs to play for all of us to reach net zero? How can we develop an end-to-end -end CCUS value chain, where captured carbon is reused in industrial, agricultural, and other applications. How can we turn CO2 from a liability into an asset? If we are able to create a carbon ecosystem that sees companies share infrastructure, reduce risks, and cut costs, we can move them, and all of us, faster towards net zero. And as importantly, we should be able to protect jobs in industrial hotlands and create new opportunities for growth. I am delighted to welcome a group of people here on stage today who have such vast experiences and expertise in what it takes to deliver on net zero. I very much hope that together we may be able to find an answer to the question I have posed. But before we come to the panelists, I would like to introduce you to Claire Curry, Head of Technology and Innovation at Bloomberg NAF, who will be moderating this discussion here today. Thank you very much. Claire, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Hisemi san If the other speakers would like to come up, I will um, introduce you all. So, very happy to be joined today, um, as you were saying, by some great panelists. Um, first up on my, well, I guess I'll go my left to right, um, is David Parkin, who's the project director for the HiNet project. Um, and on my right is Claire Harbord, who is the group director of corporate affairs at Drax. And then we have, um, last but not least, Sanjay Tugnate, who's the chief market maker and global managing partner for the sustainability practice at IBM Global Business Services. So, we've got a great combination of people. I think your introduction was fabulous, so I won't add to it. Um, what I want to start off with, though, is me asking you a question, Kentaro, about um, if we believe and we agree that CO2 and, and eliminating it from our emissions is essential, where do you think carbon capture now should be applied? Which sectors and industries need it most right now? Yes, uh, uh, the carbon capture technology will now is <coughs> applicable for uh, the so-called hard to abate industries, uh, where in the, the industries, uh, there uh, not only electricity, but co consumes a lot of heat in the process. And for those kind of industries, uh, we are using fossil fuel, and we'll have to keep on using fossil fuel for some uh, during the transition period. So. Mm -hmm. For these uh, areas, I think uh, the uh, carbon capture technology is best placed to uh, capture carbon and reduce the carbon footprint of such industries. And <coughs> specifically, sectors like cement, steel, 
Other yeah, brothers. and uh, power generation, mm. these kind of things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, Claire, being in, in the UK, um, do you agree those are the things the UK should be looking at too when it comes to carbon capture? Are there other sectors that are interesting, mm. you think, for us to look at here? Well, I think those sectors, absolutely. I mean, the great thing is that we don't just need to reduce carbon, we need to actually remove carbon. So I think that is the real challenge. And I think um, those heavy industry sectors with lots of hard to abate, and we can also talk about aviation, absolutely, those are the ones that we can really make a difference. And carbon capture can really, uh, really have a technology that, that can really remove as well as reduce. So <coughs> it's the one technology that can do both as we come into this big climate change challenge. We've been asking um, some questions or survey questions to the LinkedIn audience, <coughs> and one of them um, that we asked earlier this week was something on, um, do you believe the 2030 to 2040 net zero targets um, that basically ask carbon capture technologies to play a role are achievable? And the audience was very split. We had basically a third saying yes, a third saying no, and a third saying they're not sure. So that kind of I think reflects actually an uncertainty of the role carbon capture can play, but also a, a hope that it does have a chance to play a really important role in these near-term net zero goals, obviously very hard mm. to achieve. Um, the UK government certainly is trying to step up and play um, an important role here in, in trialing carbon capture, partly through the cluster sequencing um, projects and competitions that it's been launching. And we are very happy here to have um, both representatives from HiNet, but also the East Coast cluster that are both now selected uh, to go forward. Dave, can you talk a bit about um, the cluster sequencing program, what the UK government's trying to do here to, to scale and, and trial CCUS? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Claire. So uh, for many years, carbon capture storage was, was seen as a what's called a point-to-point -point type of system. So you have a single source of carbon dioxide and a single store that you, you transport the carbon dioxide to. But the challenge with that was it, it put a lot of risk on any particular emitter and, and the, sort of the economics of that project. So a number of years ago, the UK government and a number of industries started to think in, in terms of what, what are clusters, so groupings of industry working <coughs> together with shared infrastructure. And what that allows you to do is share some of that risk and share some of those costs. So the government set up a process called uh, cluster sequencing, which was to encourage a number of those regional clusters around the UK. And um, there's one on the south coast, there's a couple in, uh, well, there's one in South Wales, uh, the project I look after, Hynet in the northwest, east coast and, and Scotland, and to look at those and say, how can they come together as industrial groupings, build this infrastructure jointly, and deliver large-scale material decarbonisation. And that's what the cluster programme is, is there to deliver. And specifically, HiNet, where you're, um, <coughs> you're managing, what is the HiNet project? Um, and kind of, yeah, brief description would be helpful. Yeah, uh, so, so the HiNet project is I mean, it's very difficult to describe in a brief way because it is, it's very big, it's bold, it's audacious. It's, it's a major low-carbon infrastructure project, which has got two, two main elements to it. So the first is carbon capture and storage at scale, and we're looking to, to take out carbon emissions from hard to abate sectors of industry, like cement manufacturing, like fertilizer manufacturing, energy from waste plants, oil refining. But we're also mm -hmm. going to produce low carbon hydrogen at scale. Um, now what we'll do uh, to, to produce that is take natural gas as a feedstock. We will take the carbon off that. That carbon will be stored through our CCS system and it'll leave us with a very clean form of hydrogen, which we can then use to decarbonize other industries and power generation. Mm -hmm and heat and transport. So it's a true cross-sectoral, across the whole region delivery project. Great, thank you. I think you did a good, good job there, actually. So how does the East Coast um, cluster project differ, Claire? What are its main characteristics and, and benefits you're hoping to achieve? Well, the East Coast cluster is the most fantastic combination of 12 um, organisations, and we want more to join that cluster, coming together to really not only decarbonise the region, but actually to revitalise it there's a fantastic opportunity of actually creating a hub of new green technology that could generate thousands of new jobs. Our Vivid report talks about potentially 50,000 new green technology jobs, as well as protecting some of the more harder to abate sectors, the heavy industry you know, that you were talking about, and helping reduce and take and remove those carbon. So it's a, not only is it a fantastic environmental opportunity, because the Humber is the area with the biggest carbon emissions in the whole of the UK. And that's why the Humber is so important. So we've got our, we are the sort of anchor project, if you like, combining carbon capture 
with biomass at our power station. So we're going to take a pipeline, which National Grid will build, take that pipeline to the Humber and on the way pick up um, emissions from other heavy, heavy industries and then store that carbon uh, in the North Sea. So our partners are Equinor, um, SSE, um, and, and BP, of course, for the, for the aquifers uh, and the infrastructure in, in the North Sea. So it's a fantastic project of bringing lots of organisations together to really get this project uh, over the line and really capitalise on this incredible opportunity and could put carbon capture in the Humber as a world-leading technology, a bit like wind did. When you get that support from government, when you get the frameworks in place, then the projects take off. And so we're very excited now as we come into a new phase with government of how we get this project over the line and really deliver carbon capture in a time when we have time's running out. And this technology can, can, carb can capture carbon and really create a fantastic <laughs> hub of green technologies for UK PLC. Great, thank you. So I think you've all talked about... Um, <coughs> the many companies and partners required to make this a success, to your point, Dave, it's not just a point-to-point -point solution, really, and part of what your um, introduction mentioned, Kintaro, is this idea of the ecosystem. Can you talk a bit about um, what that means? Obviously, MHI is very involved in technology to capture the CO2, but what other kinds of companies and industries do you think are really important to engage and involve in this creation of a value chain? Um, yes, uh, the... Uh, of course, uh, we, we, we are the technology providers for capturing carbon, but uh, that means that uh, the captured carbon has to be transported and stored uh, to a safe <coughs> place. And mm -hmm. this is what uh, the companies in the UK, in, in UK it, uh, as uh, Claire mentioned, BP, uh, Equinor, these companies are providing such kind of service. So we are partnering with them. Also, we need uh, we, uh, we are collecting uh, the capturing the carbon from the emitters of today, meaning that there will be lot of, lots of participants. Now, uh, Claire said about 12, uh, 12 but uh, we believe that the, the numbers of emitters uh, participating in this uh, cluster will increase. Uh, expanding those into uh, sort of uh, uh, industries like uh, waste, waste, waste to heat, uh, they also burn the waste. <coughs> and uh, emit carbon. So we are uh, developing a system to capture uh, the carbon from such kind of uh, emitters as well. So mm -hmm. uh, there will be many, many participants in that uh, sort of uh, uh, you know, uh, clusters. And uh, these are all our partners to build uh, this uh, uh, carbon market, I would say. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. OK, and so <coughs> Sanjay, I'm going to yeah. bring you in here. Thank you for being patient. Um, no. IBM is a partner of MHIs as well in yes, this space, but obviously yes. you don't own pipelines, operate steel no. mills, etc. Right. So can you talk a bit about your interest in, or well, IBM's interest and your own interest in the carbon capture space and what sure, you think you can sure. bring? No, thank you so much for the question, Claire. And first of all, thank uh, Ken and MHI for uh, making us part of uh, this very exciting project. So when we, uh, you know, started this partnership with MHI, I think IBM, if you, uh, I'm proud to say that uh, this week itself, we got the first inaugural award from uh, His Royal Highness Prince of Wales on the Terra Carta uh, as the inaugural, and IBM was one of the few technology companies which was awarded the award around sustainability. And uh, that's fundamental and core to our belief. So when uh, uh, the <coughs> MHI group was looking at creating a platform uh, leveraging technologies such as AI, blockchain, and hybrid cloud, uh, we were, uh, you know, very glad to partner with them. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, what we feel is that once the technology, which is uh, MHI is a leader on, is managing on the capture, then after that, you basically need to capture, measure, benchmark, and report. And that's what the Connex platform, which we are creating, uh, in as an ecosystem and partnership where you know you get other players who are the emitters or uh, who would be the end customers which we will partner with will actually be able to leverage the data transparency uh, and and be able to uh, uh, orchestrate and see what is it that they really want to do as part of this uh, ecosystem so that's the role which IBM plays along with uh, MHI great so yeah you mentioned market there and demand yes. right um, Claire, as you were saying, obviously the government has um, definitely a strong role to play, but it feels like there's also 
a need for a more transparent market demand, whether that is maybe providing a, you know, a way of being able to pay and value a premium on green steel right. or green concrete, or it's just being able to separate that CO2 and, and trade that separately. Absolutely. Um, one of the other LinkedIn questions that um, we asked earlier this week was actually about this idea of what is the most important requirement to actually create this carbon value chain um, ecosystem. And the results came back being quite varied, actually. We had some answers. Um, Almost half, 41% actually said a global carbon market or a global right. palm price. Maybe that's not surprising. 29% said new sizable end markets, so demand for right. captured carbon or green products. 18% said actually new transport and storage support <coughs> is necessary. And a final 12% said it was about global regulation. So again, it's quite varied. It's, it seems like um, people believe there's a whole load of new things that are required. And we definitely right. talked a bit about the transport, the physical infrastructure. Um, we haven't really talked too much about um, the government support, and I do want to come on to that. But on this, this point about the new sizable end markets, can you talk a bit more about what that means for... I mean, how is digital playing a role there? Right. Is it, is it in certifying the green products? And right. if so, how does that work exactly? Or is it more in creating actually a global carbon CO2 market? Right. So you use the word digital, and uh, I must uh, mention something which uh, Paul Polman, the ex-Unilever uh, CEO, mentioned is we had the industrial revolution, we had the digital revolution, we have the sustainability revolution, the speed of digital. So if you really want to meet uh, the single common goal of 1.5, I think uh, the role which uh, uh, carbon capture plays is very eminent because you have multiple technologies which will do multiple things, but carbon capture, I think, is one fast way of meeting the 2030 and the 2050 goals. Uh, so just to give you a sense, uh, we are doing work which is around AI and blockchain, and uh, today the press release came out with uh, a similar project with WBCSD, where at the product level we are tracking uh, so in, 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 a, in a bottle of detergent, every molecule uh, and how much of the carbon is, is going into creating that detergent. And that's exactly the same process which we will need to follow when we look at capturing the carbon and then making sure that uh, whether it's the emitters or the users, how do you manage the entire supply chain and ensure that they are actually uh, infusing or, or making, whether it's green steel or whether it's making other greener products. Uh, because go, you know, going forward, that's what consumers will look at, mm. is if I'm picking up this product, today you have uh, the label which is at the back which says these are the food ingredients on it. That's exactly you would you would drive to in saying, this is the amount of carbon content, and that's how this technology can really help bring that down. So you're able mm. to capture it, measure it, benchmark it against other products, and then report it. Great, and that's part of creating this more visible yes, kind of demand absolutely. market. And trust protocol and transparency can be only created uh, mm -hmm. by leveraging something like a blockchain AI with uh, with the right and the correct amount of data. Mm -hmm. And Kintara, is that your interest then in, in working with IBM, this idea that right now there maybe isn't as much demand for carbon capture technology as, as there should be, and obviously government mandates play a role, but yeah. it's also yeah. about generating visibility and yeah. the value. Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, well, at least uh, for the first stage, I think, uh, talking about the clusters, uh, we need some sort of a government support to make this uh, industry uh, go into a commercial scale. And that means that, uh, yes, uh, some of the, uh, the uh, funding from government is required in such kind of systems. It means <coughs> that uh, the players have to have some such kind of a transparency about how <coughs> the fund is going to be used. Mm -hmm. So. I think uh, we need a platform where you know the data and the information is transparent, and we all us all understand who is benefiting, who is benefiting by how much. And uh, I think uh, our co-work with uh, IBM <coughs> is going to create such kind of a platform where everybody can get into, all the participants of this market can get into, and understand what the benefit they are getting from this market. Mm -hmm. And going back to that survey, the survey results talking about this, this need or the participants believe there's a need for a new sort of global carbon price and carbon market. And I think there's debate about whether that's ever really going to happen. But it sounds clear that intervention from government or governments is important to, to, price, um, to, to price the value of CCUS. For the maybe just 
focus on the UK for now. Um, Claire, what do you um, what do you want to say, or what have you been saying to the UK government <coughs> about their role in in scaling CCUS? Well, I think it's the role of governments is absolutely critical, and we have had carbon technology uh, around for some time, and we did have a, a project, you know, some years ago. Some of you might know the White Rose project, and government pulled the funding sort of overnight, and we've had to re-establish the confidence and, and working with, part with government to, to bring that. And I'm delighted that you know, we now have really strong signals coming from government, and only this week that actually the cluster process is now proceeding, and <coughs> so that is fantastic. But what we really need in, 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 the, in, the, in the industry is to have the regulatory and investment frameworks yes. We stand ready to invest. We are all ready to go. I mean, we've, mm. we've been trialing our technology. It is doing carbon capture at our power station right now. So we need the investment regulatory uh, structures. We can then go to our investors and, and, and we can then set up this, this and scale up. This is about scaling up. It's all ready to go. It's about scale at, at a very big level. So we want those signals from government and then we are ready to rock. Uh, and we are very excited about you know, the net zero strategy that the government just published, the bioenergy strategy. Uh, you know, we just need now pace uh, to actually uh, get this over, <coughs> over the line. But we are, we, are, we are ready to go. And I mean, Dave, what, what are those, when Claire talks about signals, um, what are the signals you're looking for uh, you think are important for HiNet? Yeah, and I, I mean, Claire's, Claire's covered a lot of this, but th we shouldn't underestimate just how quickly the UK government is moving on this. Um, they are doing phenomenally well. And you know, as, as industry, we do give them a hard time saying we want it even faster. Um, and that's right, because you know, we, we can't wait for a global carbon price. Um, we can't wait for um, green products to sort of charge a premium and that to flow back into the market. So we do need that support structure in place mm -hmm. now, effectively. <coughs> but the government is committed to do that. Uh, and the government has committed to get that regulatory structure um, and, and sort of the support mechanisms in place to allow projects like Claire's, like mine, to take final investment decisions in, in 2023, mm -hmm. which you know really isn't very far away. Mm -hmm. We're planning to be operational in 2025. East Coast Cluster will be there or thereabouts as well. Um, and that is a huge sort of um, uh, stepping stone for, for the UK to then build out further ambition beyond that. But getting those first projects mm -hmm. up and running mm -hmm. to demonstrate to mm -hmm. investors, to demonstrate to other companies to demonstrate to other countries that this is a viable technology for, for net zero is really important. So, so getting specific, what are the regulatory structures that you actually want mm. to put in place that you think are realistic? Yeah, sure. I mean, we, we could spend a huge amount of time on this, so I will, <laughs> endeavor, to be, I will endeavor to be brief. But um, one of the big steps forward for carbon capture and storage in, in the UK has been the recognition, and going back to my previous point, of shared infrastructure. And when you have that shared infrastructure, it starts to look and feel very much like a regulated asset. So essentially, it's a, it's a monopoly, like the onshore electricity transmission networks or gas networks. So what we need is a business model which is, and a regulator, which essentially allows investment in the asset and then the owner of that asset to then earn a return over a period of time. Mm -hmm. Now, government has set up the framework of that. They now need to appoint the regulator. The regulator needs to get to work and actually put in place what we call a price control mm -hmm. and allow that investment <coughs> decision to be made. But all of that is happening. It's just let's turn the handle even quicker. Okay, great. That's helpful. So, so beyond that idea of the regulation, which clearly is important, what are the other specifically the other signals you think you would look to to government, Claire? Not just for the East Coast cluster, but long-term mm -hmm. scaling. I think if government could give the signals how important the net transition is for this country and it is a really important priority. I know obviously in a post-Brexit, post-Covid world, you know, the government is under a lot of, of pressure and I do hope that the momentum that we have here at COP continues in government policy, that government continue to make net zero you know, a really important uh, priority. And as I said before, there's a real win-win here because it's not just environment, it's the social and economic benefits that the green and fair transition could bring to this country and give us a leadership role in the UK. You know, when we do partner up with government, like the wind, I always think is a fantastic example. When you get government aligned with uh, business and new technologies, you give that funding framework. Look how renewables, and wind particularly, has really taken off. And everybody wins. We, we, have, you know, we lead the world in wind technology. It's on our system. We have the highest amount of renewable energy because of wind on the system. And we lead the world. And, great news, 
you know, the prices for consumers are lower. So when we get that partnership yes. together, then it can really uh, bring great, great rewards and a, and a great prize for, for the UK. And um, Kintara, we've talked before about the fact that obviously um, there is a price premium to be paid, right? I mean, carbon capture costs money, as does obviously the transport and the storage, and it's particularly first-of-a-kind projects. It's great the government is, you know, willing to commit money to, to these these trials, but in your, in your mind, um, I guess if you could give the audience an idea about what are we talking about with the additional cost of carbon capture on a steel or a cement facility? What is that cost that you'd expect to see in terms of dollars or, or euros per, per ton? Oh, yes. Uh, well, a, a very, very uh, you know, rough calculation shows that, uh, uh, well, today uh, the, uh, we're not talking about, uh, you know, the uh, uh, carbon pricing from the EU ETS, for example. But right. uh, now uh, they are talking about the range of uh, 60 to 75, 75 euros per, per ton mm -hmm. or something like that in the current market range. So, uh, yes, I think for the, uh, it depends on the size of the project, but uh, uh, some uh, things, uh, basically, it, we are very close, I believe, mm. uh, in that range uh, with the current technology uh, uh, of uh, carbon capture. And uh, with such kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, carbon pricing, that I think this is a, yeah. uh, it, it has a very good chance of flying off, yeah, taking off. And is that, I mean, is that the best way governments can support CCUS, you think, is through creation of carbon markets, I mean, national or regional carbon markets, to, to create a carbon price, which then makes mm. it obviously cost competitive, oh. or is there other routes well, you'd rather I, I, go? Well, I would just uh, lead, <laughs> like to leave it to, you know, <laughs> the business parties. Uh, our interest is how, how, yeah. how to build it, but uh, okay, in order so, to make so it a business case, you know, I think, uh, yeah. So opening uh, up that question then, yeah, anyone yeah. else, I mean, do you think that carbon pricing in a carbon market, like UK's version of the EU ETS, is the only thing that's needed? Or are there other things like mandates, um, regulations to reduce emissions, other forms of subsidies? Yeah, so ha happy to sort of chip in on that. So um, the, the carbon price in the UK does help a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, 50 pounds a tonne. Um, if, if it gets much higher than that, quite a few bits of carbon capture infrastructure will start to pay for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and if it continues to rise to £100 a tonne, a huge amount of carbon capture and storage will happen without any other intervention. Mm. So, so the carbon mm. price is really, really important. But the challenge with that is a lot of our industrial emitters are producing commodities which are traded on a global basis. Right. Mm. Um, and the challenge yes. is if you have um, other jurisdictions around the world who are producing the same commodity... Without that carbon pricing mechanism, it becomes very difficult for our for our UK producers to protect against that. To be competitive. So you, mm -hmm. you you need to retain that competitive element, or simply you decarbonise in the UK just by deindustrializing. You just shut down, yeah. um, and that isn't the right answer. So we need to combine that carbon pricing with some mechanism of, of ensuring that there is a, a level playing fleet. Level level playing field. Okay, that, yeah, that's a great point because that's not entirely clear to some people, right? If you are a power plant emitting, the carbon price kind of helps you maybe Absolutely. pay for CCUS. But if you're making steel in the UK, sure. you're not going to compete if it's green with others making steel somewhere else where there isn't a carbon price. So Sanjay, going back to your idea of this platform, how does that fit in here? Because what right. you're developing with MHI or talking about developing is mm -hmm. a global platform, right? Correct. That Correct. Will that create a global carbon price or, or value? How does that overcome the problem Dave was talking about? Right. So I think, uh, uh, just let me take a step back, and I think uh, one of the things which we, we, we need to be focusing on, and, and I think I like what Claire said, is how this COP26 is changing the game uh, you know, going forward. And I think for the first time, the other Claire, uh, we actually uh, are seeing that countries, companies, and consumers are aligned. Uh, there was a lot of high decibels, but today the decibels are followed with dollars. And the only reason we have a common goal, which is 1.5 degrees Celsius. And that level of clarity uh, has been brought by this COP, you know, alignment of countries, companies, uh, uh, and consumers. And I think the more we believe in the SDG goal 17 of partnerships, uh, and that's what this uh, ecosystem does, right? Uh, for example, uh, I'll just give you a sense. Uh, one container ship uh, from uh, China to the U.S. used to take about 200 pages of paper documentation. Uh, 12 trillion uh, tons 
of trade is is what the container shipping uh, does. We then partnered, similar to MHI with uh, with Maersk, mm -hmm. the leading, created Trade Lens, uh, which is uh, one of the largest uh, uh, decarbonizing logistics platform, which you which even Maersk, and taking that example from Maersk, we have now got sixty percent of the world global container shipping trade onto Trade Lens. So seven trillion dollars worth of trade which is now where five other of the largest shipping like Hapag and some of the others have joined uh, uh, this uh, platform. And it's completely on uh, trust protocol, uh, data, transparency, using AI, uh, blockchain and hybrid cloud, similar to what we're doing for MHI. I'm drawing this example uh, because this is now processed 50 million uh, container ships, uh, 25 million worth of uh, you know document, which can you imagine the amount of uh, wastage? And uh, so this is what platforms do. Mm. Once you build uh, a platform with the right level of trust and transparency, you create an ecosystem of partners, which now starts with MHI, but will bring in uh, you know the government, the cluster, the emitters, and all together on a global scale. Uh, and that's what truly we we believe uh, that this platform will deliver uh, for uh, meeting our net zero goal. Okay, so it could help, for instance, again, go back to that maybe green steel example in, in yes. Europe, somewhere in Europe, exactly. selling green steel at a premium to someone in Yeah, but Japan, I, I don't know that, right? Unless I have this and I can say, okay, it's transparent that this uh, company has produced mm -hmm. green steel truly because that's what I really want to. And this is what is the trust protocol which builds in. Uh, 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 and, and unless you have that, you will... Because consumers today, when pre-pandemic... It's like, you know, the animal testing uh, back in the days uh, when people and, and, you know, consumers said, if this product is tested on animals, I'm not going to use it. But how do you sh tell that this is tested or not? Once you'd say that, then you would say, OK, green steel. OK, fine. I'm ready to pay a premium. But I need to be exposed to the fact that, you know, as, as Dave, you know, very relevant point, because we are in a supply demand situation, right? The markets will dictate the price. But giving transparency to the end consumer or to the end uh, mm. buyer that you have a choice now, mm. right? It's similar to uh, ordering a Planet Earth T-shirt and wearing it, you know, in front of the Webex for your friends. You order that T-shirt on the same day. An empty truck comes to deliver that Planet Earth T-shirt to you, right? It's a matter of convenience, not necessity. You could plan that three days in advance, right? And you emit less carbon by getting that one day t-shirt, mm -hmm. right? So today we are in the convenience, not the necessity zone. So as long as the transparency is there, consumer behavior will change. And that's what we need to drive to, is changing the behavior of the consumer. And the Planet Earth t-shirt is a classic example because mm -hmm. all of us order the same day, but the amount, that, that single truck coming, the planes flying, the amount of CO2 emission, if you plan well, each of us, and it's it's all about it starts with me. Uh, you know, is is if we can play our own part, uh, I think we'll uh, we'll we'll save the planet for the future generations. And so yeah, thank you. That yeah, that's um, an encouraging message. And I think your explanation of the platform makes a lot of sense when you think about there probably won't be a global carbon price, and we do need trade yes. of green products across different nations. Right. Um, Kentaro, obviously, you're active in across all of. Europe or all of EMEA, um, where else besides the UK do you see a demand and interest um, and, I guess, economic viability for carbon capture? Uh, eventually, uh, there are countries who are still uh, on, the, uh, on the path of developing their economy, economy and uh, uh, many, uh, you know, uh, lots of, uh, a, a big population is uh, wondering when, where can we be as rich as the European nations, <laughs> for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, the, these areas, particularly in Asia and Africa, uh, they have to uh, industrialize, further develop their industrial uh, segment, uh, as well as meeting the decarbonization goal, which they have also committed to in this uh, COP26. So, mm -hmm. uh, the point is that if uh, w why we are active active in UK is that UK is leading the globe in this uh, <coughs> through this clusters uh, uh, the uh, there is a model of uh, capturing the CO2 storage and building a whole 
you know, value chain of uh, CO2 over this. And uh, if uh, uh, this, uh, model, this business model becomes successful, uh, we see that there in the world, there are many areas which <coughs> require such kind of solutions. Uh, the heavy uh, emitting countries at this moment with heavy industries, but they still need that steel, cement, these kind of things to build their infrastructure. So these are the countries which will certainly benefit from mm. the success case in the UK. So uh, this is where uh, we are working together with our partners in the UK, uh, where we can uh, to uh, strive for a successful business model, which we can expand globally uh, into heavy populated and heavy industrialized uh, yeah. uh, countries. Yeah, this is, uh, well, I would say my, my, my wish. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and yeah, your point, we haven't talked about it yet, but your point about emerging markets is obviously very valid. There are lots of markets out there that haven't had a chance to industrialize, like UK and Europe has. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I really stuck now with climate goals, but also with this issue of there isn't really a, a replacement for fossil fuels in making steel, cement, and mm. so forth. Right. Um, when we look at the UK as a potential leader then in, in scaling this technology. Maybe, Claire, are you, are you looking at either Drax or with the East Coast project, e expanding it to other parts of the world? Are there other countries you think could benefit from this? Absolutely. And, you know, the world is watching. They are watching how is this cluster going to take off and are we going to get it over mm. the line and what are the kind of government business models because other governments have got this problem. How can we remove remove carbon quickly to achieve our goals. So a lot of people are watching us and we are talking to the Americans as an example. Um, they are very, very interested in this technology. Um, I, was, I was talking to the, to the Australians last night. You know, this is, this is a, a technology that can be, um, you know, used all over the world. And all these countries have got a real problem. How can we remove carbon? And if you've got this technology mm. and it's here, and let's see how the UK, who've done brilliantly on wind, they're watching. So, so let's take that opportunity. And you know, that's why it's so fantastic at COP to showcase this technology and actually educate and show the world. And on your point that you were saying, you yes. know, educating the consumer, th yes. these technologies are here and we need their support to get the politicians over the line because the politicians yeah. listen to the people. Yes. Uh, and so the more to get elected again. To get elected <laughs> again. And so if we can, you know, share the story, share this unique technology and just help push it over the line, then the whole world can benefit. And is that well I mean said. well said. Yeah, thank you. Um, Dave, with the HiNet project and its particular characteristics in the Northwest, are there other parts of the world you think could, could copy that model? Yeah, sure. And, uh, you know, one of the things we haven't talked about really today in terms of HiNet is it, it's really a hydrogen story. The, the carbon capture and storage is, to an extent, it's the means to the end. It, it, it allows us to produce low-carbon low hydrogen at scale. And as part of HiNet, we, we are building a full hydrogen value chain. So it's hydrogen production, it's a hydrogen distribution network, it's a new pipeline, it's hydrogen storage at scale. Um, you know, just to give you a sense of that, our hydrogen storage facility is 2,000 times the size of the biggest battery being built in the UK. So it, molecules of hydrogen give you system flexibility mm -hmm. without the carbon penalty of fossil fuels. And I think that model of hydrogen in the energy system is really, really sort of transportable around the UK. And certainly lots of countries in Europe, um, North America, Australia, Norway, they're all looking at how you can get to low carbon hydrogen at scale. Some will utilize uh, carbon capture and storage as part of that. Some will go down a, a green hydrogen route mm -hmm. using uh, renewable electricity. But I think the, the role of hydrogen is going to be really, really strong. And I think CCS has a role to play in that hugely across the world. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I guess going down back into the hydrogen part there, are there do you think that, is your view that the, the role of hydrogen and carbon capture is here to stay, or is it a stepping stone to get to uh, you know, green electricity to hydrogen? And then there's a, I don't want to get into the huge debate about the coverage of each one, but it seems like CCUS is seen by some as a stepping stone to fully decarbonize, seen by others as actually part of the solution. How does that fit in the hydrogen community? Yes, I think, I think one of the more most uh, overused phrases in the energy transition is there is no silver bullet. Um, now, there is no silver bullet, but I like to think that hydrogen isn't far off. It reaches places in the energy system which other technologies don't. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, if, you, if you look at the energy system of today, we're getting more and more renewables on the system, which is fabulous. 
but the system flexibility is still provided by fossils, uh, fossil fuels. So when the wind doesn't blow, we turn on gas-fired power stations. Um, when heating dem demand goes up over winter, we turn on our gas boilers. And we need an, uh, an energy vector which can replicate that flexibility, mm. and mm. That's, that's where hydrogen comes in. You're right, there are different pathways to make hydrogen. Um, one of those is from renewable electricity, um, called green hydrogen, and one is from um, methane, carbon capture storage, uh, and that's called blue hydrogen. Now, I think if we're still doing carbon capture storage to produce blue hydrogen in 100 years' time, we've got something wrong. Um, mm. But if we don't do it now at scale, oh, there's no way we're going to hit mm. 2030 targets or 2050 targets. Yeah. So it's, it's absolutely a transition. Um, mm. But what we're doing with HiNet is we are utilising hydrogen production with carbon capture and storage um, to start with, and that allows us to build out our infrastructure. So it builds the pipelines, it allows industrials to convert, it builds the storage, and then progressively you can bleed in the green hydrogen as it becomes cost-effective, as it gets rolled out at scale, and you've got that transition. If we wait until green hydrogen is ready at the price point we need, at the scale we need, mm. I mean, not to put too fine a point in, it will have fried the planet by then. Mm. Yeah. So this, this is an important point, right, that I think people have when they, or critics have when they think about carbon capture. Some would say that it's just delaying us getting to a fully, you know, green or, or somehow a cleaner, a cleaner world. Um, but it does seem, to your point, and actually, Claire, you mentioned this before, too, the point about urgency. Yes. Do you also see CCUS as being, funding it and scaling it as being important right now because there aren't many other options? And long term, what does that look like? for heavy industry in the UK? Does it rely entirely on CCUS? Does it partly go green? What's kind of your, as, as David was saying, maybe the 50-year, 100-year outlook? Well, I think, as David's saying, I think we need the mix. I mean, mm. there isn't one silver bullet, but I think carbon capture gives us that pace and action to actually get where we need to get to. You know, time is running out, and we have got to have... We've got a technology that's ready to go, so why on earth wouldn't we use that and give it uh, everything that we've got? Because we've got to make some real impact and action. But that doesn't mean that we don't invest, mm. explore, <coughs> um, really encourage all these other technologies. And they all have their part. There isn't just one thing. But of course, we have to come off fossil fuels. That, that is absolutely a an, an, an non-negotiable. But I think carbon capture has a, a real opportunity <coughs> now and in the future. But, you know, um, any investment from governments and all these scientists and industry to really develop and invest in these green technologies can only be the best for our society and for our planet. So, mm. you know, let's go. Let's, let's do it. Let's do it together. Um, Sanjay, you were mentioning that, that you're also working with the WBCSD, right. the announcement I think that came out today, yeah, you yes, were saying, you're right, Claire. and others thinking about, mm -hmm. to, to Claire's point, we cannot just focus on certain, I mean, CCUS has a part to play, of as course. does a lot of other technologies. Of the of beauty course. of digital and the platform you've yes. been talking about mm -hmm. is bringing in a whole range of other sectors to right. create this visibility. Sure. Can you talk a bit about the WBCSD announcement? Because I sure, think that plays sure. quite nicely. No, absolutely. And in, in fact, uh, uh, there are two announcements which happened this week. Uh, the first one which happened was on uh, Fast Infra, the project uh, uh, with HSBC uh, and uh, as, a, as, as one of the anchor uh, uh, clients, uh, IBM is there. We have about 70 to 80 other institutions, BNP, Paribas, Meridian, we have NGOs, we have government. I think a lot of the uh, you know conversation we are having uh, I think the finance, and as, 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 as Mark Carney said, there's $130 trillion. I don't even know how many zeros in there, but $130 trillion, which we're talking about. Let me just talk quickly about the one, Fast Infra, and then I'll move to WBCSD, because Fast Infra as a project, we, there are three numbers to remember, Claire. Uh, 3, 30, 2030. Uh, let me explain that to you. Three is the COP uh, goal for mobilizing finance. Right, so all of these projects we're talking about, number three is for that. 30 is $30 trillion of deficit uh, identified by HSBC for sustainable infrastructure investments by 2030. So three, 30, 2030. And when you look at what Fast Infra has done is we have now created, similar to what we're doing with uh, the Connex platform, it's exactly the same idea is we're bringing all of these institutions together, the supply side and the demand side, uh, and we are basically connecting them 
uh, leveraging hybrid cloud, AI, and blockchain to create this platform. And I'm happy to report that $9 billion of transactions have actually gone through uh, Fast Infra as a project, right? So that's again a case exactly of, of bringing partners together, bringing institutions, bringing NGOs, bringing uh, private sector together with a single focus on sustainability. WPCSD is, is, is similar. It's a pathway, the project pathway, and uh, uh, it's, it's just phenomenal. If you look at what WBCSD, headquartered of Geneva, has done, Peter Becker and, and his team, I think, and we are proud to be a part of that project, where basically, if you look at using leveraging data, because that's the core, right? Uh, trust protocol, transparency uh, is what we are creating by creating this platform, where we're bringing in all of these uh, companies together, and if they need to understand what is the data-based supply chain getting into a product, right, at, at, the, at the molecule level, at the product level, and how much of carbon uh, is going in, that's what this platform provides. So I can exactly know uh, through the upstream and downstream what is the actual carbon intake in, in a specific product. <laughs> And I track that, and then I and I work with all of my ecosystem partners to reduce that uh, carbon in that product level. Mm. Uh, so that's again a very different kind of partnership. And all of these things two years ago, you know, nobody even dreamt or thought of. Yeah. I mean, uh, but today I'm 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 just so excited. The fact, as I said, you have a single goal, 1.5. So once you have a goal, you can measure it, but you need to have data and the right technology to be able to measure that. Yeah. Uh, uh, otherwise, we'll be all working in silos and there's no collaboration. So that so the WBCSD um, work is interesting because that also yes. gives another potential demand platform for of things course. like carbon capture yes. Yes. and it connects the, to Connex right. even. Absolutely, clear. And in fact, if you look at look at all the companies which are there on WBSD, you have Dow Chemicals, you have Uni I mean, these are potential partners who can join the Connex ecosystem because they'll either be, be uh, emitters or they'll be the ones which mm. will need that uh, uh, carbon. So again, you know, and I think that's where that fast infra connecting with Connex, Connex connecting with WBCSD, you know, that's the power of the network and the SDG 17, which we will be able to create. Yeah. Uh, and COP is a great, uh, great place for, you know, having these conversations and then executing uh, on them. Yeah. So, so on that point, you were mentioning, yeah, chemicals companies, food companies, yes. and so forth. Kentaro, beyond what we talked about, which is kind of the heavy industry sectors, are there others you think you'd like to see adopting carbon capture? I mean, Claire, you mentioned aviation, right? Mm -hmm. I know you're working a little bit on thinking about shipping mm -hmm. as well yeah, for carbon okay. capture. Yeah. yeah. Uh, shipping is one area, yes. Of course, <coughs> uh, in the shipping industry, uh, so... Uh, the development for alternative fuel in the uh, shape of e-methanol or e-ammonia. This is also progressing, but uh, also uh, there will be uh, ships which will be still uh, running on uh, fossil fuel for quite some years from now, you know. And to retrofit uh, such kind of uh, carbon capture systems to those uh, fossil <coughs> uh, burning uh, sh uh, vessels, mm -hmm. this is one area which we are looking into, and which will be, as uh, Claire mentioned, it's a, a very quick, you know, adaptation adaptation for uh, 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 reducing carbon foot foot carbon footprint. And uh, also, uh, I think uh, uh, Europe and the world will see more. Uh, waste to energy plants coming out, and uh, mm -hmm. this is an area which we, uh, uh, although it is not coal, but it still <laughs> emits mm -hmm. carbon. So uh, this is uh, a, 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 this is a, a, a technology where uh, globally uh, that can be applied to such kind of waste to energy plants. So these are the areas which I think uh, the carbon capture technology is a very very uh, a quick solution. Mm -hmm. to decolonize such kind of uh, areas. Yeah. Great. And just before we, um, we run out of time, yes. I wanted to go back a little and ask the question again about um, government support. Dave, you mentioned that UK government's moving fast. There's all exciting things happening. Are there other countries or other um, regulations you think the UK could adopt or others you're kind of admiring? I know before the panel you mentioned something the US has been doing recently. Yeah, so the, the, there are a number of countries around the world who are, who are sort of 
tackling the same issue. Um, so I guess a couple to look at would be uh, the US. Um, there's a regulatory system there called 45Q, which actually supports carbon capture and storage um, and is effective and it's simple and it's out there. So there's an awful lot to be said for that. I think slightly closer to home, you could look at the Dutch sector. So uh, in Holland, they have something called SDE++. And that essentially puts carbon capture and storage on the same playing field as other low carbon technologies. Mm. Um, and essentially they all bid into a government support scheme uh, based on a pound per ton basis. Um, and that's quite a nice model as well. So there are certainly other models which can be looked at for other countries to follow. Claire, anything to add there on anything else you think the UK government could be looking at abroad and absorbing <coughs> other ideas? Well, I think the Americans, it's fantastic, isn't it, to see the Biden administration really now starting to move. But I think, you know, going back to your point, any kind of global collaboration and you know we've talked about governments but also you know there's also the academic and scientific community mm -hmm. and governments have a huge part you know the IPCC the climate mm -hmm. change commission uh, in the UK so I, I think governments working with these the scientists to actually develop these new technologies and de you know develop this common understanding so that we can all work on these degrees together I, I think it's a real collaboration to, to get the right solutions. Great, thank you. So I want to wrap um, by just hearing um, your thoughts or takeaways about COP26. Um, some of you have been here a long time, um, and we've certainly all experienced, I think, some of the excitement um, of some of the announcements coming out last week and this week. Maybe starting with, um, on my left, so Kentaro, can you share briefly what's excited you most about any of the announcements or projects that you've seen at COP26 so far? Yeah. Uh, in COP26, one of the uh, most uh, exciting events for me was that uh, there were uh, some uh, initiatives from the developed countries to support the developing countries in mm. their decarbonization. And as I said, uh, those countries need uh, further development of their infrastructure. At the same time, they have to uh, consider about decarbonization. This and uh, the uh, developing countries pledge to support such kind of decarbonization of emerging economies. Uh, this is, has been a most encouraging uh, factor for me in this COP26. Great, thank you. Dave, what about you? Yes, I think the, the most exciting thing for me so far has been the announcement on reduction in methane emissions. Um, so I think we, we can, we're going to continue to see natural gas used uh, in, the UK, uh, in the UK and global economy for, for a good while to come. Our particular hydrogen production process takes out 97% of the carbon that comes into the process. But mm. if you've got upstream methane emissions, mm. when you're drilling for methane, when you're transporting <coughs> it, that ain't so good. Um, so anything we can do to improve the carbon footprint of methane is hugely important, mm. I think, for, for our industry moving forward. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to agree. That was exciting. And I think for me yeah. also, mm -hmm. anything on pledging to protect rainforests is so important. We've not talked about it, but obviously there's lots of other ways of naturally um, right, absorbing CO2, right. and obviously trees are a big part of that. So that was good to see like recommitment on that front. Um, what about you, Claire? Yeah, yeah we'll agree mm. with all that you've said. But I suppose for me, um, Really exciting. We've had over almost 30 countries saying that they are going to come off coal mm. uh, very soon, and that is a fantastic win. Um, it's very close to our heart at Drax because we were the biggest coal-fired power station in Western Europe, and we have now changed from coal to, to biomass, to bioenergy, and so it's very close to our heart. We managed to convert that, that huge power station mm. Uh, with the infrastructure, maintaining all the communities <coughs> and, and the jobs and all the technologies and the carbon capture that we pioneered. So mm -hmm. it's fantastic that w other countries are making that pledge. And we, we offer that support as well. We are an example that you can do it. Uh, we've done it in Europe. We're the biggest one, and we've done it. So we offer our support. And if you want to come up to our power station across the world and come and <laughs> see how you can do it, you know, we'd love to share that experience with you too, because coming off coal is one of the most important things for the industrialised uh, countries mm. to get to, to that very important yes. net zero target. Right, yeah. right. Absolutely. Uh, completely agree and would love to take you up on the offer. Great. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> to me, learning uh, has been a great experience on a daily basis at COP26. Uh, and I think there's an African proverb, uh, which, I, which I want to state here, which is... Uh, if you want to go uh, uh, fast, you go alone. But if you want to go far, you go together. And uh, I think that's what this COP26 has taught us, uh, that together 
we have a single goal of 1.5 degrees and i think the only way we can achieve that is by sdg 17 uh, partnership uh, but uh, i agree with most of the other panelists on the other points but to me togetherness uh, on achieving that single goal is is what uh, really excited uh, me at cop 26 this year great thank you all that was fab we have a few minutes left before we before we end um i believe there's a potentially a floating microphone in the audience. If there's anyone who wants to ask a question, you are more than welcome to. Otherwise, we can, we can end there. <coughs> yes, um, it's uh, Jan Christoph Napilski from the Maurice McKinney Muller Center for Zero Carbon Shipping in Copenhagen. Thank you very much for extremely valuable points. Um, I would like, like to ask you a question on your view of the upscaling uh, of solutions. Uh, we have formed part of Mission Innovation together with the governments of Norway, uh, the US and, uh, uh, and Denmark. And the goal is to reach 5% uh, of alternative fuels by 2030. Uh, going together will bring us far, but we also actually need to go quite quickly to reach it. Uh, I would be interested to hear your position on it. Also on market-based measures, actually we published a paper on market-based measures just today on exactly this issue. Thank you. Who wants to answer that? Ken? <laughs> yes. Uh, for the alternative fuel, as uh, uh, I mentioned, uh, uh, we, we are also working with the, the uh, Musk Miller McKinsey uh, Zero Emission Center about uh, the introduction of alternative fuel. And uh, in terms of that, uh, this, uh, uh, we believe that uh, ammonia could uh, be a very, uh, potentially a very uh, prosperous fuel for this uh, sector. And uh, as David mentioned, you know, uh, green ammonia is everybody is looking at. But uh, if we look at uh, today's world where we need uh, more electricity to electrify all the solutions like the EVs and, uh, you know, the heating of the houses and these kind of things. Uh, we think that uh, 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 we need such kind of a technology of a blue hydrogen as well as converting into blue ammonia in order to make this uh, market, you know, uh, a pickup. So uh, in that sense, I think also uh, there is an area that uh, carbon capture can also you know, participate in such kind of uh, creating the e-fuel for uh, the maritime industries. Mm -hmm. Great. Any other questions? Thank you. Hi, Peter McFadgen from Equinor. Um, David, a question for you, if I may. Um, there are obviously many similarities between the industrial decarbonization concepts which the East Coast Cluster and HINET represent, but um, obviously some differences as well, which is what I'm interested in. So um, perhaps for those who aren't familiar, at, at the East Coast Cluster, the intention is to build bespoke subsea in, uh, infrastructure for the export and injection of CO2. You, your project has quite a different philosophy, just to hear your reflections on that, and, and perhaps also the potential for the, for the recycling of legacy oil and gas infrastructure and how important that is in your project. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, re really good question, and yeah, very happy to talk about that. So yes, the HiNet project is, is largely predicated on reuse of existing oil and gas infrastructure, which is hugely important. It's important environmentally because it means that we, we're not creating so much construction disturbance. It's important economically, um, and it's a really good sort of circular economy story as well. So, and because the assets are there, it allows us to get to market sort of um, sooner than we, we would do if we were building from new. So, um, I think that is definitely a model that can be replicated um, around the world as we transition from an oil and gas world to a CCS world. There are, there are elements of legacy infrastructure around the globe which can be repurposed. And we actually only need to repurpose a relatively small proportion of what's out there to, to achieve what we need to do with carbon <coughs> capture and storage. So, yeah, it's been right at the heart of the HINET project um, and I, absolutely a replicable model. Um, you know, it, it does come with some constraints potentially about what exactly you can do with the infrastructure, but I think using that as your baseline reduces risk, reduces cost, reduces environmental impact. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Great. I think we're about out of time. So thank you so much for your questions and thank you also to the panelists. You could join me in um, thanking them for their comments and their time. Thank you.